Um, but I want to welcome you and thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. You're joining us from the East Coast, so I know it's, it's later as well. So we appreciate that extra time and energy that you're putting into this event. Um, I'm going to read a, a bio that I kind of composed from various bios of Ambassador Kroll. The purpose of the bio and my reading the bio is because the topic today is so important and I think that it's relevant that you understand what Ambassador Kroll's background is and why he is one of the most important people who could be speaking to these, these events right now. And we're very you know, honored to have him do so. So Ambassador George Kroll was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and raised in New York. He attended St. Peter's Preparatory School in Jersey City and earned a BA in History, magna cum laude at Harvard University. At Oxford University in England, he received both BA and MA degrees in philosophy, politics, and economics. In addition to English, he speaks Russian, Belarusian, Polish, Uzbek, and I think he said also some Hindi, and I think there are other languages in there, but that's all he's admitting to. George Kroll joined the US Foreign Service in 1982, taking assignments for the State Department in India, Poland, and Ukraine. In 1991, he was U.S. Consul in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. From 93 to 95, he served as Deputy Chief of Mission and Charge d'Affaires in Minsk, Belarus. Between 1995 and 1997, he was Special Assistant to the Ambassador at Large for the New Independent States. And from 1997 to 1999, he served as Director of the Office of Russian Affairs, those two positions being based in Washington, D.C. In 1999, Ambassador Kroll was named Minister Counselor for Political Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, a post he held through 2002. That following year, 2003, he was appointed U.S. Ambassador to Belarus, a position he held through 2006. It was in 2003 when I was already working for USAID in Belarus that Ambassador Kroll joined the Belarus team, and I was honored to serve under him. In 2007, uh, Ambassador Kroll served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs. Among his responsibilities was engaging in direct consultations with Uzbek government officials, which may have been one of the reasons why from 2011 to 2014, Ambassador Kroll was the ambassador to Uz Uzbekistan. From 2015 to 2018, he was the ambassador to Kazakhstan. In 2018, Ambassador Kroll was awarded the Order of Dostik, the Order of Friendship by the President of Kazakhstan, Nul Sultan Nazarbayev. And in 2019, Ambassador George Kroll was awarded the Belar Belarusian Democratic Republic 100th Jubilee Medal, an honor awarded for quote, lifetime achievements in the popularization and research of Belarus, strengthening of the independence of Belarus and fighting for freedom and democracy in Belarus. Currently, Ambassador Kroll is an adjunct professor at the U.S. Naval War College and an associate at Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. He also taught at the National War College. So welcome, Ambassador Kroll. Was there anything I missed, or is there any terrible mistake? Well, the worst mistake, uh, Christine, was that you said I grew up in New York. I, I have no affiliation with New York City or State, although when I was at high school in Jersey City in New Jersey, I could look across and see them building then the World Trade Center, uh, sadly, uh, no longer with us. But uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey on the other side of the river, but uh, other than I meant that, to say New Jersey, my apologies. <laughs> A lot of New York, a lot of people make that mistake. So <laughs> anyways, I, I wanna welcome all of you um, and uh, from, from Rhode Island where I live in Newport. And uh, I know you have, you have Newport Beach uh, out there in California, but this is the, the I guess the, the original American Newport and the like. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's nice to uh, uh, see people on the West Coast uh, for a change from, from the other coast. So, uh, but, um, other than that, uh, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, it was 30 years ago uh, when in, in back in December uh, that the Soviet Union uh, 
ceased to exist. And at that time I was serving, as Christine said, in what was then Leningrad, St. Petersburg. I spent most of 1991 in the Baltic Republics uh, covering uh, their ordeal and then was sent down in 1992. I returned to Leningrad, St. Petersburg, which was how I first met and worked with on almost a daily basis with uh, then functionary of the St. Petersburg city government, man named Vladimir Putin. Uh, and uh, he was basically in charge of uh, dealing with foreign, uh, uh, foreign affairs for the, the mayor's office. And uh, I ran into him subsequently through the years in Moscow and the like as well. Um, but in those days, I, I, you know, I, I said it was almost in daily contact because the number of American visitors and issues we had to deal with at the time. And uh, in 1992, I was then, uh, my, my assignment in, in Russia ended. It was, of course, that period where it was very chaotic, very difficult to be living in yeah. Russia at that time, the Soviet Union collapsed. And, uh, uh, you know, there were uh, Reno Harnesh, who's one of the people on this uh, video, uh, you know, had was also involved in, in uh, providing assistance and humanitarian assistance to Central Asia and others. But in 1992, my onward assignment was Kiev, Ukraine, where we had just opened our embassy. And I spent uh, a whole year there um, in Ukraine, I was a Russian speaking officer. So I went to Crimea and the Russian speaking areas. And it was, uh, you know, a lot of hurly burly uh, those early days. And, and then in 1993, I was then uh, seconded, sent up to, uh, to Minsk, Belarus. And the, so the rest of my career of 30 years was basically the former Soviet Union, moving to the west, east into the Central Asia and Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, which is I was ambassador there when I retired in 2018. So it's very, uh, very hard. Well, for me, 30 years later to see what is happening in that, that area of the world uh, that, I, that, that, that I worked in and, and, and lived in for the last 30 years and to see war and destruction. We don't have an embassy anymore in Minsk, Belarus. Our embassy and all that we worked in in, in Kiev is now closed, um, moved to Poland. Who would have ever thought that in the 30 years ago when there was the euphoria, it seemed of new independent states uh, and uh, with what futures were before them that we would come to this 30, 30 years later of a crisis across the whole area, I would say of the former Soviet Union. So it's, it's quite a, a historic time, but quite a, a, a time for a great deal of reflection uh, and, um, and what to do about it all. So uh, much on my mind, as painful as it is when I think of all the people that I've worked with and served with, like Christine knows and Chris Crowley, who's on this too, who were, you know, who Chris was uh, head of the aid mission in, in Kiev and all the Ukrainians we worked with and knew and the like and what, what they are going through and the like. It's, it's personal, it's painful uh, for me personally and, and as for many others and probably many of you who are, who are, uh, who are listening and, and watching this today. So anyways, Christine, thank you for inviting me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, thank you. And, and you're right for at least a handful of not more uh, people uh, in the participant list it's, it's very personal and I, I do want to do a shout out because he'll probably ask a question. You know, Chris Crowley, who's, who is one of our participants today was, as Ambassador Kroll said, he was the um, mission director in Ukraine for Ukraine, Belarus and Moldova. So I reported to Chris Crowley and to Ambassador Kroll for activities in, in Belarus. So it's my honor to have both of you, you know, online today. Thank you both. Um, you just sort of gave a, you know, a, a great segue to the first question I was really interested in asking you um, ab about Putin. Um, how does he think? So you've known him now for such a long time. You've been, you spent your almost all of your career, you know, in Russia slash former Soviet Union. H how does he think? Who is he and where is he today? And is any of this 
to somebody like you who's tra who have who's tracked him for so long, is this a, is this a believable path for him from somebody who has watched him for decades? Well, I wouldn't want to say that you know I I was a close friend of, of Vladimir Putin or a confidant uh, and, and and worked with him. I you know it was a it was a, an official relationship when when we were in St. Petersburg together. Uh, you know, he he uh, he was working for then Mayor Anatoly Subchak. Uh, before that, he had was working as the uh, head of the foreign students office of Leningrad State University, which was definitely a, a position for KGB officers in order to keep an eye on the foreign students um, in, uh, in, in, at, at the university there. It was his, his own alma mater. And uh, I just remember when he first appeared and, and I realized since I was a consular officer dealing with uh, the, his, the office that when he appeared, um, it was kind of like a breath of fresh air, I would have to say, because the, you know, the old Soviet uh, apparatchiks that were working there were, you know, were, were uh, they were at a loss of what to do. I mean, they were not part of the team of Anatoly Subchak, who himself was viewed as a, as a leader of a, of, of, of a, of a new Russia. Uh, he was a, 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 an excellent orator and, uh, and one of the key uh, uh, key movers of change uh, in the end of the Soviet period, and uh, and and Vladimir Putin was he someone he knew uh, from being a professor as Sobchak was at uh, Leningrad State University, and and brought Putin on to be his basically foreign affairs person to deal with the foreign missions like our consulate, as well as all the delegations that were. There were there were coming into St. Petersburg, many of them from the United States and others, and business people, whatever, because frankly speaking, there it was viewed as as this was an opportunity for a lot of businesses and people to get a piece of of the action, as it were, properties, uh, uh, businesses. You know, I, frankly, I, I it, it it's it seemed to me like you know the 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 vultures. There's the corpse of the Soviet Union. And there are all sorts of people coming in there from foreign areas with all kinds of motivations. Um, and they all would descend on St. Petersburg and want, you know, something. And they all wanted to see Anatoly Sobchak and the like. And it was fairly chaotic. But when Putin arrived, uh, we immediately sat down and said, look, there's got to be order to all of this, uh, which I certainly agreed uh, with. And uh, that he would see many of these people before Sobchak. And we even had our own system of, you know, A, B, C, what plan we had uh, as for all these delegations and people, because they were swamping our consulate too. And I have to say that um, we had a very good working relationship because I understood, you know, what it was, what he was going through of being just flooded with all these. And also the humiliation that he and many Russians felt that all these people coming in being very condescending and saying, well, we can give you this. We know you can't do that and whatever. And again, these are very proud people and, and, and also feeling uh, very much put upon. And I believe that he, uh, and I could see you know, him kind of seething, listening to a lot of this condescension and whatever. And I, and I empathize with him. And uh, because I was feeling the same way too from at, at that time. And I think this had that, 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 tr when he said it was a tragedy, well, if you were living in, in there at the time when all the money that was in the rubles in your pocket one day were worthless and the pensions that people had and all of the things that people expected the government to provide were diminished for everyone. You know, people could only, they were selling things on the streets, old people just to buy enough food and the food, what there wasn't much there. It was a true catastrophe because Leningrad, like much of the Soviet Union, the St. Petersburg was all dependent on all the connections with all the other arid areas and territories and, and cities. It was a very, you know, it was a very a uh, top-down society and much interconnection. And when those links all 
fell apart because of independence of the various republics and everything. It was a difficulty for everybody uh, and, and also a crisis and a, a true tragedy because you couldn't even travel. There was no, there was no gap, there was no, there was no aviation fuel at the time to fly to other parts of our consular district. We had to take the trains and, and, and fuel for cars was very much in, in low supply. It was really, I mean, you had to live there to realize what it was like um, and the people in this and to survive and to adapt to it. So, you know, this had a great effect on everyone who lived there, including me. But I think for somebody who is a Russian living there like Vladimir Putin, it was apparent that this was a huge crisis, a traumatic moment. And uh, the feeling of protectiveness and defensiveness and things of this nature were you could you could see this and feel it, and the sense that you not so much me but other Americans and other people come in don't really empathize and understand what we're going through. There's this condescension, and this I think has had a very big had a very big impact on him, and over time and many other Russians too, uh, including Boris Yeltsin and others that, 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 you know, felt that they were not treated well and, 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 were, uh, you know, and we're, not, we're not taken seriously and, and, and we're also not, uh, we're not given sort of the respect or the empathy that they felt uh, they should have. Um, and the sense of, of that, you know, other republics that, uh, you know, including in Ukraine and everything, that why are that, that, that this that this was very traumatic uh, to live with and and live through. And I think with somebody like Vladimir Putin, who has changed. I mean, when you're in power for 20 years, it has an effect upon your um, uh, upon your outlook. But this sense of wanting to re become, as it were, great again, uh, and to be respected. And to be feared, and the sense of betrayal that their efforts early on to be a partner were spurned by the Americans and by others because it was thought Russia is weak, Russia doesn't matter. That he, that he and others took this very personally and felt, well, never again do they want, and they will want to bring back a Russia that is respected, but also. Uh, there is a, 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 a almost historic mission because if you were raised in understanding the history of Russia as Vladimir Putin was, even in the Soviet period, as a, a great, you know, as an empire, as, as also that has been thwarted in its effort to bring together the Slavic, the Eastern Slavic people of, you know, the white Russians, the Belarusians, what they would call the little Russians, the Ukrainians and the great Russians into this idea of Rus, you know, the, of Russia, this, this image of Russia that I had in the minds, not only of Vladimir Putin, but many other Russians that the Soviet Union was, was terrible because it destroyed the statehood of what should have been a great Russia as did World War I and the like. And the sense of history and the sense of trying to right a great wrong weighs very heavily in the mind of someone like Vladimir Putin and many other Russians who feel that this is, this is almost a matter of destiny and also a matter of security of what it is and their own identity of what it is to be a Russian. And when I was in Ukraine and Belarus, you saw other places other societies and, and countries about trying to develop their own identity of themselves. And this set up an immediate conflict with the Russian sense of identity. And one thing that you learn uh, in, 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 as a diplomat and when you're in another country or in your own country, there are certain things you can't change. You can't change geography. You can't change your neighbors. And frankly, you can't change your opinion of your neighbors or their opinion of you. You have to deal with it and manage it. And with somebody like Vladimir Putin and many Russians, when I served later in Moscow, 
uh, was, was also to understand this mindset and how do you manage it almost as a psychologist, realizing you're not going to change it, but how do you try to work with it and manage it in a way that is not going to lead to conflict or, 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 um, um, or, or loss of life, things of this nature, but understanding that there are some very serious divisions of how people view themselves and view their own security, and they have to be taken seriously, and they have to be dealt with and not ignored. So the Vladimir Putin of today was somewhat of what I saw then, but has felt that Russia has come out of that period. And as he's in maybe his, you know, he, he's only, he's going to be 70 years old, you know, and not, and not so much, but I think the sense of destiny that here was somebody that no one ever thought would become a leader of Russia. Certainly I remember when he became the prime minister, when I was in Moscow and the president, it was like, where did this guy come from? I mean, I, it, but he was somebody who was decisive and he could be brutal and ruthless. And I think someone like Boris Yeltsin figured this is the only person that could keep this place, this very huge fractious place of Russia together is somebody that is decisive and ruthless. That to be a politician, frankly, in any society is a certain amount of ruthlessness that is needed in order to succeed. And, um, and Putin had those qualities, which I think Sobchak saw in him and that, and that Yeltsin saw in him. And I think that we're seeing today, but where will it lead uh, Russia at the end of the day when it is isolated and hasn't perhaps achieved the goals that was set out to, uh, that were, that he set out for to 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 make it uh, the great power again that he has in his mind as many Russians have. I hope that is somewhat coherent. It, it is coherent, and it's a, a great lead-in then to to my next question. So today, Secretary of State Blinken said. There's going to be a Ukraine longer than there's going to be a Vladimir Putin. And uh, uh, Khodorkovsky uh, also said, asked, is Putin's defeat inevitable? If he looks like a loser, then there may be a coup. So what are your comments to, to both of those statements? Well, I, I would say that uh, there, there is an awful lot of speculation and, you know, about Vladimir Putin. And, and when I hear, well, Putin thinks this and Putin says that and uh, psychoanalyzing Putin, I mean, I, I just did it, I guess, myself. But, you know, at the end of the day, he is, he is not just one person. He reflects a mindset of many Russians. Uh, who feel like he does. It's not that he's an aberration. And that's kind of the sad part of it because, okay, Putin is not immortal. Uh, he will go. But the thought that, oh, he leaves and all of a sudden Russia will change, uh, I think is, is, you know, it's wishful thinking that is not frankly realistic. Uh, and that, uh, you know, there will, because he is, he reflects a powerful feeling and a sense of identity of many Russians. And to say that there are other Russians that want to get rid of him, um, maybe there are, but I don't know if it's enough, uh, you know, you know, or the type of people that, that would, because he reflects a view and a feeling of many, even though there are many Russians that don't agree and protest against it. But when you go into, you know, the Russia of not Moscow or St. Petersburg, you know, these, where there is a, a, a hatred of those Russians from the rest of Russia that don't have all the fancy cars and the big, you know, skyscrapers 
where life is rather grim and where they get a constant diet of the, you know from from news uh, of uh, from the, the that the government is 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 setting out that they have their own phobias and their own chauvinistic ideas like other peoples do uh, you have to factor that in um, and while there might be uh, many if there might be Russians suffering from this they there is there is there there is a mindset there that you have to reckon with. That is not going to change overnight or simply because Vladimir Putin uh, you know, is, is gone from the scene. Um, that's, that's, that's wishful thinking it, it, and it's not so realistic about understanding Russia. You know, Ukraine too has its own endemic issues that it has to deal with itself. It will be very difficult to overcome uh, as, as any country does, including our own, I would say. We have to look at ourselves, too, um, of how many people believe certain things or, you know, fake news or what's true or whatever. This is affecting everybody. And to say that, like, a young generation of Russians that didn't grow up under the Soviet Union, oh, that they're going to be better, they're connected, their social media and everything. What I found is, is yes, they don't have that, the Soviet experience, but they have brought, been brought up and you look at how, what they're taught and everything of Russian history and everything is this is a sense of nationalism, which can be dangerous for the neighbors who also are developing nationalisms of their own that tend to be ones that were different from you. And then that goes to we're better. And what we're seeing throughout the Soviet Union, a former Soviet Union, is this you know, growth of these nationalisms in places where for 30 years they've been growing to a certain extent, and will this lead to conflicts? Because most of these people are not, don't have the relationships they had with one another in the Soviet Union, where they all went to the schools, they served in the military together. They, it was a common heritage they had but the younger generation, no, they don't travel to, they'll, they'll more, more sooner know about Spain or Rome than they know about you know, traveling to Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan or even Ukraine for that matter. And so they become more separate and that creates issues of yourself, you know, of, of, of other issues uh, that can bring conflicts as we're seeing throughout the former Soviet period from this new generation coming to, to, to the fore uh, that have a far more nationalistic uh, view of themselves vis-a-vis -vis their neighbors. So again, you set it up for kind of for the, the next sequencing of thought, which uh, a former CIA chief of Russian operations um, is, is postulating that if if there were to be a coup, um, who, who is likely to be behind that and, and or who today should Putin be afraid of? And his premise is that Putin should be afraid of, in his terminology, of his fellow spies. Live by the KGB, die by the KGB. What are your thoughts about the role of the was the word uh, Siloviki, the Siloviki, the security the and power, military. The, the, the security people, yeah. Right, what, what is your thought about their role and do you, can you imagine that they ever would be discontent enough um, to have a force and that was anti-Putin? Well, you know, all of the people around um, Vladimir Putin to the, you know, the small group that are, you know, people of much of the same ilk and they're all dependent on one another, but on him. Uh, as, you know, when you're in power for 20 some years, there are a lot of dependencies. And, and also most of these people are not what you would call, you know, the courageous types uh, because who would put, who would want such people around you you want people that are 
will say yes to you and you give them uh, you know, their, their wealth and their riches and they have a lot of it. Uh, and, and, and the sanctions won't really uh, harm that um, against them. And, and so it, it's hard to see anybody around. This is not the Politburo of the Soviet Union where you know, these were rivals, particular, but when Stalin was alive, they weren't. They were all you know, puppy dogs, if you will, uh, doing whatever you know, the, the great leader wanted because they were all dependent and they knew if any one of them uh, could be taken down you know, by the leader uh, that is Stalin, who knew how if you you could just you could get rid of people in the security services and bring newer people in uh, that will do their bidding, and so everyone feels a certain amount of vulnerability. And 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 uh, Vladimir Putin's meeting, public meeting with the National Security Council of his own, was really you know in a way a remarkable sign because he humiliated all of these people in on public television, probably much to the uh, much to the delight of many Russians who, you know, don't, don't care for these people. There's probably like, yeah, give it to them, Vladimir. Uh, and the like too, that it's hard, it's hard to see like who, you know, some would say, oh, well, unless he grooms a, uh, a successor, but that's very hard for people to do because they themselves become the sense that they, 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 they are the state. And frankly, I've seen this with, you know, Christine and, and Chris, you know, with Lukashenko. It's, he can't think of himself as anything but the president of Belarus because he's been the only president and for 25 years, and I've heard him say this publicly, what else can I do? Uh, this is all, this is what I know. And I saw this with Karimov in Uzbekistan. Um, Nazarbayev tried to stay on in, the, in another capacity, but I think somebody like Vladimir Putin feels that He's what holds this together and in his own mind, but others are quite fearful. And as long as he does have, you know, the, the security services who will be always kind of well paid uh, and to do things that, because for them too, it would be, uh, you know, their, the end of the kind of world that they had. Now, if they all lost confidence, in him, uh, that is the, the security services. And if there would be anybody that would, uh, that, that would um, uh, emerge, it would be quite a, um, you know, a, a, uh, a, a courageous person. It's hard to see that coming out, but then again, things work in strange ways and people appear just like Vladimir Putin that nobody really knew about. That could come to the scene, uh, in and who knows what the internal intrigues are uh, within, you know, the Russian the Russian leadership. Uh, I, I think you know anything could be on the table. I'm not excluding that could happen, but I certainly can't pinpoint a person uh, that 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 you know could could organize this, or that there's the group of, for instance, of the security services that say. This has gone too far. We have to stop this. It, it has to end. I mean, people felt that was always thought is that was going to happen with Stalin, but Stalin died an, a natural death, uh, and and then the scramble became uh, happened. But um, it, it 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 is a hard it is a good question and a hard question, but one I don't think that there is a you know any clear answer uh, to to it as to Will he have his own successor pick? But he doesn't seem to have done so unless, you know, they're all kind of much lesser people than he is. Uh, and it's very hard to, to have a successor when I think you think of yourself perhaps as a czar and not really as an elected leader. There's a lot of insight in your answer. So thank you for that. I know these are complicated questions. So I'll move to some of the questions from our members. So one of the questions from Bill Edwards, what are the options for the Ukraine war from your background and perspective? Well, the, uh, the, the options are probably all pretty bad. Um, 
if if you're looking at the uh, you know realistically and and from you know from from a you know from, from what the russians are capable of what their capabilities are and uh, and and from the ukrainian perspective again it's a matter of coming to the is you know again it's it's it it is very painful to think of this as ukrainian but it 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 is or anyone um to again recognize you can't change your geography and you can't change your neighbor uh you have to manage it and how do you manage a neighbor that has its view that you don't really exist, you know, as a separate people. Uh, you know, we're all one people, and we're doing this for the the good of all of us. And we will we will we will do everything necessary to make this happen as your imperative. And you have a it's a country that has enormous resources, has nuclear weapons, and is you know willing to do a lot. Um, I remember President Nazarbayev told me once that, you know, with, with he, you know, here's someone they have, Kazakhstan has a 7,000 kilometer border with Russia. They have 20% of their population are ethnic Russian right along that border. And Kazakhstan's a country, it's a huge country, the ninth largest in the world, it's larger than all of Europe. It has 17 million people. Uh, and he, he said that, I I worked learn you know I, I was part of the Soviet Union I know it I you have to manage the Russians they will eat grass to get what they want if you put them in a corner they will and and put pressure on you and throw things at them they will come out even more irrational more stronger with their fangs and their and their claws and everything he said we know what it's like dealing with them that's why we have to be very careful how we deal with them. And he would also say, we don't want to end up like Ukraine and like Georgia that felt that they could just confront uh, Russia and think that they have the backing of you know, the United States or Europe because at the end of the day, they won't. And for Kazakhstan, it would say, and I'd say Nazar, uh, Karim of Uzbekistan would say the same thing to me that, you know, we can only rely on our own wits because no one is going to come to our defense uh, if push comes to shove with the big neighbors we have, that is Russia and China. For them. And so, you know, it does come to this matter of what can you expect or get out of it to end this bloodshed that would have to take basically unpleasant decisions that will not be maximalist, uh, but keep yourself alive and more or less independent by managing this, this, this neighbor that you are not going to defeat on the battlefield perhaps, uh, and you will lose much of your country and it will be very, you know, the destruction we're seeing, the human loss, the economic loss, the like is what they have to, to look forward to the longer that this continues. And so therefore unpleasant decisions may have to be made that, you know, which is the, the stuff of diplomacy, unfortunately, is that no one will like what the, what, the, what the end result will be, but it will be, it may be some result that at least everyone can live with uh, that, uh, ends the escalation and the unpredictability of where this can all lead, which could only look to leading to even more destruction and a wider scope of destruction, including in Russia itself and much of its neighboring countries. Wow, that's not sobering, is it? Um, Bill Thayer asks, what do you think the chances are that Putin will be, you sort of answered this, I think, will be removed from power by a coup? I think you've pretty much answered that, right? Yeah, it, I mean, it could be, but I don't think, I, I wouldn't uh, bet, bet, the, uh, bet the family farm on it. Okay, next question. Why won't NATO countries come to the aid of Ukraine? 
Well, because, uh, you know, that widens the conflict. It's not just Ukraine because the Russians, you know, would be willing to, uh, to go to the nuclear office uh, option if necessary. And I don't think there are many NATO countries that want to go down that road. Uh, and, you know, there's the idea, oh, well, we can put lots of, you know, uh, weapons uh, and support Ukraine. But at the end of the day, it may not be a military solution to this, but it, it, you know, it, it is, it only takes you so far. And uh, my question is, and then what? Uh, uh, you know, what, what do you get for it? Uh, so I think uh, NATO, again, is, is feeling, well, it will defend itself, as has been said, uh, but to extend its, uh, its actions into Ukraine against Russia would risk an all out European war and, 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 and worse, uh, it could be a nuclear war. And, and that is uh, not something I think leaders in Europe uh, wish to, wish to, 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 to th this to lead to. And, and this is something that they have to take very seriously because it can right. lead to that. Mary Catherine asks, I'm interested in your take on the Russian military and their perception of their war against people who speak their language and are obviously not happy with the attack. Yes, I, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, you know, have much familiarity lately with the Russian military and, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's morale and everything, you know, we're hearing all sorts of things that you know, Russian soldiers are giving up, and 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 they're writing home, and like, and I'm sure this is all happening. Uh, I, it, it seems to me the Russians aren't really looking. You know, this isn't World War II where they're you know they're sending in millions of of, of, of ground forces, you know, or in these in those huge battles of of the past. Uh, perhaps they miscalculated in thinking that you know through through threatening and that the Ukrainian, that somehow the Ukrainian people would give up or that, you know, the pressure would be too great because they don't want to have a war and, and with Russia and, and face the destructiveness of Russia. And so Russia is showing them, you know, gradually, you want more of this? You want more of this? You know, we take out, you know, shoot it. And a lot of it is, you know, is missiles, artillery. Uh, where you don't see the people that you're killing, and I think they're, you know, they're pulling back, <coughs> you know, from, you know, sending in face-to-face -face troops because when they do, you do have this issue of, look, you didn't invade us, we're inv you know, invading you, and what, you know, yes, we speak the same language and everything. This is a problem for the military, but I think they're trying to adapt it by then using, uh, you know, the the missiles that, you know, can wreak destruction and you don't see or hear uh, the damage that it's doing. And frankly speaking, other countries have employed this kind of war. This is modern warfare. You don't send in all the troops. You use your air power. You use, you bomb the cities. Uh, you, 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 the, the popular, you know, the command and control centers. And yes, bombs fall on, 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 uh, on, on, on civilians. And many civilians die, as we have seen in other conflicts uh, that other countries have pursued and not just the, the Russian Federation. Uh, and, and this is what we're seeing, I think, is that, you know, they, they, you, we've seen it in Syria, you know, it was Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever, but Syria, even with the Russians too, is, uh, and the like, you don't, you're not going to send in forces. You demoralize a population and, and destroy. Uh, even though it has meant in Ukraine, a, a surge of patriotism and an effort to, to stand up, which is, you know, it, it is, is obvious and the like too, but can it prevail? Um, it might. And there's, you know, that may be wishful thinking, though, if you're facing a foe that is willing to use these weapons, these sorts of weapons, uh, in order to uh, force uh, the Ukrainians 
and their supporters, including you know, the, the, the Western countries, to seek a peace to, to stop it. Because at the end of the day, they want to be, have the upper hand or in, in this, that is the, the Russian Federation in this. Uh, so complicated, yes, um, not easy. No. Another question, do you believe President Biden's remark about minor incursion had any influence on Putin's decision to invade Ukraine? Well, I don't know about a, a minor incursion or that. I, I think that th that the Russians understood that NATO was not going to go, I mean, that Ukraine is not a member of NATO and that and the United States made it clear that no American forces would be sent to Ukraine and that the American response would be economic, uh, severe, and that you know, there would be weapons uh, sent to Ukraine and everything we've done short of a direct involvement. And I think the, the Russian leadership feels that there is, again, that no, the United States and and much of, of Western Europe, you know, with the exception of those that are on the Eastern side, like Poland or whatever, that do not, that, that this is not a battle, this is not worth their existential, uh, of risking their countries, their economies and the like. But for Russia, it is because of the importance to Ukraine for their own sense of their own, for security, and again, this whole sense of how they see themselves and identify this area of the world as being a critical part of their own identities as far as, and, and also a part of their own security, that it is far more. And, and they, and frankly, uh, Vladimir Putin and other Russians have made this quite clear over and over again to Americans and to others about what the results would be if, for instance, moving NATO eastward and the like. Back in 1992, 94, the first foreign minister of Russia, Andrei Kozarev, who's, you know, warned, uh, you know, the United States uh, at the very time wrote an article for foreign affairs, like it's uh, basically predicting all that was what did we see happening if the United States and, and others were to expand NATO. And again, there's a question people say, well, if we didn't, you know, now this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, but on the other hand, it was that opportunity perhaps to, you know, where Russians would say, we were willing to be a partner. And yet this is what you did to us. You know, you expanded this alliance because of those countries that wanted it against us. And, and, Andrei Kozarev now, he lives in Florida. He's you know, viewed as a traitor in Russia. And he's now, he spoke to my class at the War College here uh, virtually. And, you know, is, you know, saying that, you know, yes, now we see what has happened. I mean, he, he, he is not a fan of, of Vladimir Putin and feels that, you know, th this is what has happened in Russia is terrible and what's happened in society like too. But, this is um, this is a, this is an issue of you know of how the Russians view how important this is to others in Europe and the United States and how it's important to them, and they see a difference. And I guess my my question, in part based on what you were talking about, is a question will sound maybe um, like there's a simple answer, but how or maybe it's rhetorical, but how is it that Putin moved his military, just moved the military on into Belarus as a staging ground for Ukraine, probably isn't gonna leave Belarus. And there's, there's not a word about that. Granted, the Belarusians have been squashed severely the last year or so, the the activist types, but how does how does that silent takeover does that bode 
from what might happen elsewhere? The Baltics, how, how could that happen? Why did it happen? And there's no one saying a word about it. It's like they're gone. Too bad. Well, Christina, as, as you probably know, having lived in Belarus and dealt with it, and, um, I think many in the United States and elsewhere in Europe kind of felt that Belarus was always a part of Russia anyways. It was never considered that important. Um, uh, and, and, you know, its leader, Lukashenko, played games, you know, and, and you know, he's, you know, he's no Democrat by any means, but, you know, he's, he's, he, he, he's created his own Belarusian, well, Belarus is now a very different place and it has its own national sense and identity and, and the like, you know, there was opening up, many have traveled abroad and like too. Uh, but, um, and Lukashenko was always very clever in playing, you know, often getting as much as he can from the Russians without having to give up too much sovereignty or independence until, uh, you know, these elections that took place in 2020, where, you know, this large outcry of, you know, of, of, of people demonstrate peacefully in Belarus, not to join NATO or the EU, but against wanting Lukashenko out. And he's, a, you know, he's a survivor. And as long as he could keep the, you know, his, uh, uh, security forces to do what he wanted and to and to basically put down this uh this this rising against him it cost him his own sort of reputation with many Belarusians who are suffering now economically uh and uh, it, as a result of 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 what of Lukashenko's policies but also now that they are part of the Russian um uh, uh attack on on Ukraine even though Belarusian forces are not physically present there. But Lukashenko has found himself that he had in order to survive himself, which is his biggest issue, is is he had no other choice but to let the Russians in. Um, and they know they can't force them out unless the Russians decide they will leave, which who knows when that may be. But it's not like they're running that I mean the Russians are you know don't run the country day to day. Uh, but um, they certainly, uh, and I'm sure uh, Lukashenko, who never liked Putin, and Putin never liked Lukashenko, uh, it's an uncomfortable relationship for, for Lukashenko, who doesn't, where he doesn't really have any other uh, outlet since he's a pariah completely, it seems, in Europe and with the United States. And it's only Russia that that he can counter, but it's at a price. And I don't think, again, it's the peculiarity of Belarus and its leader and its uh, system that has, in a way, led to this. I don't think the same would have applied to the Baltic republics, or certainly not Ukraine, which you know is in a, a very different position than Belarus, because Interestingly enough, it never it never had a very powerful leader. It was always, you know, it was messy. It, it was, you know, there were the factions of the East and the West, the Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers and like, and it was kind of the seesaw in their politics. And then the overall power in the hands of oligarchs, of wealthy people, but never concentrated in the hands of one person. I mean, why Yanukovych, who was, that was basically removed by other oligarchs in other ways too. So Ukraine had a much different political system because it never, it, of its own political makeup that couldn't, couldn't, it didn't come up with this leader like you've had in Ukraine, uh, like you had in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan of one person controlling and in having that power uh, to to control for a long period of time, it's it's the interesting element of Ukraine, both what makes it attractive and the like, but others had viewed this. That is, if you look from the standpoint of someone like a Lukashenko or a Karimov or a Nazarbayev, that this was a weakness for Ukraine because they never could get their act together to have a strong leader who could unite that country in a way uh, to be able to manage 
uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Russians on their side, on, on the other side, because they could always be played off against one another. Now it's somewhat different now because you have a Ukraine that even, you know, the, the, the Russians, ethnic Russians and Russian speakers, there seem to be, you know, they're not happy that their country has been invaded by other, by Russians. And it's created a different environment. And so the real issue will be, I would say, Oh, if the Russians prevail, what are they going to do with Ukraine? How can they run a country where they would be viewed as deeply unpopular in any Ukrainian that would be working with them? The, the level of repression they would need for a country that has been far freer than Russia has ever been would be extraordinary. And that may be, you know, where the Achilles heel of, of, the, of the Russian system will be that, okay, what do they do with it then? is this dream of bringing together the three pieces of Rus, you know, Belarus, Little Russia and Great Russia, really possible now uh, because you have, there is the creation of a Ukraine and perhaps even a Belarus, uh, the way people in Belarus are shocked by what has happened with their neighbor Ukraine and their shame that they feel about being complicit with it. This, it will be a very interesting uh, a, a set of circumstances as well as perhaps in Russia itself uh, as they come to terms with what has happened um, in, in these days and, and, and the months ahead. Uh, so if and when Russia returns to sanity, quote and unquote, do you believe its interests lie with the EU rather than with China? Well, you know, they, they, there's sanity in their sanity. I mean, there's a matter that they view, they view the rest of the world maybe insane and that they're the sane ones, you know, in the, in the sense that, you know, you have to have power politics. This is the real world. It's a jungle there. And this idea that, you know, again, I, I I don't say that facetiously, and I and I respect the question, and it's and it certainly is is one I you know I would ask myself uh, and the like, and I do ask myself, like why you know the like, but there is there you know there is a a a a, a pernicious logic to all of this, and you know as far as you know the Russians like like the Chinese and others, they are fond of saying. That nations do not have friends, they have interests. And you know, the, the, the Russians, you know, you know, they look at China as the Chinese look at the Russians and say, what is the opportunity for us out of this? And I think, you know, the Russians were more than happy that they, they could have an opportunity, you know, they, they view themselves more as Europeans than Chinese. The Chinese are very far. Europeans, they they feel. Russia is part of Europe, and that's one thing they keep saying. We are part. Why are you walling us off? Why wouldn't you let us? You can't have security in Europe without Russia. We're the largest country in Europe, after all. Uh, but you won't accept that and treat us like like what we are. You treat us as always a threat. And again, one can say, well, you well, look at what you do and the like too. And you can have these debates, which you know seem to have been stifled and like too. So. Uh, I mean, Russians, you know, are not of one view, one mind. Uh, but I think for, for those in Moscow, that you know, their sense is is more they're European, and China is yes, can be a partner uh, to extent, but some a country that they will certainly keep at more of a distance as being really foreign to them than Europeans. You've answered this one a bit, but the, I think the question is still um, valid to ask. As the financial pain, as the financial pain increases for Russia, will there be an internal movement to remove Putin? Bloomberg says national bankruptcy is only weeks away. Well, it, you know, it, like I said it, it could, it could be. It's just who, who is. You know, Russians out in the countryside have been hurting for a long time. Uh, if you go out to, you know, medium-sized cities, again, forget about Moscow and St. Petersburg, where all this money is con concentrated, where, you know, it's just incredible. It looks like 
Las Vegas or Xanadu all together, um, in Moscow, that is, and the like. Um, when will it really hurt Russians? I mean, Russians are used, you know, out in there, you know, with getting by, uh, but it is changing their lives and it's, uh, and, and, um, and worsening it for them. But then there's a matter of, well, taking matters in the hand and, and doing something about it, you know, is something that, that could happen spontaneously if, if, if there is the, the, you know, the, the, the lining up of individuals who have exceptional talent at organizing. I mean, who thought that Lenin, you know, out of a small, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a person no one even thought about could lead a revolution in Russia because of the collapse of the system. Is it possible, you know, that you could see a repeat of, you know, the collapse of, you know, the vaunted uh, Russian forces as it was in World War I, uh, defeats and the like, and then, uh, you know, but having a, a czar who lacked nerve and steel and the like too, what? I mean, there are all kinds of, you know, you could spin these things out, the, these kind of views out there. But yeah, it's, it's it, anything is possible. The likelihood of it happening, I, I would say there, you know, they're, like I said, would they eat grass? Is Nazarbayev right? Um, these are perhaps the people, no, they may not eat grass, but you know, they tighten their belt or whatever. But I think it certainly is a worry of Putin who has been always saying about how difficult the demographic issues that Russia faces, the health issues they face, the, the you know, the, the, lack of investment in infrastructure that are all weaknesses and vulnerabilities that might come to the fore as this putting all this effort into a military buildup as they've done over the last years and come to a state of 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 um of not a clear victory in 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 ukraine you know, it could certainly have ramifications of the type that Know, have been have been put forward. I, I certainly don't exclude that. Okay, Scott Van Hoften asks, do you believe that our current set of sanctions on Russia are being effective? What would you recommend for specific sanctions going forward? Well, I, I think it, it's a matter of time because again, we, we all seem to want instant gratification that uh, uh, sanctions you know, will we'll, we'll immediately cause the, the Russian government to say, oh, we're, we're, we're going to stop. We're going to have a ceasefire and a peace and go back to the like. It, these things, we, they, they, the effects of them all, it's like warfare itself. Once you start war, you never know where it's going to end and what's going to happen. It then becomes a matter of adjustments and the like. And I think with sanctions, there is no such thing. I think you know, pinpoint sanctions, like pinpoint bombing. There is no such thing. There's always collateral damage. There's always the 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 the, the dam the damage and the un, you know the it's not tidy or anything. But we shall see. You know what the repercussions of this will be. You know down the line, it may take months. It may take the uh, uh, a couple of years. Uh, that's what it it took for the you know. When, when in World War One, you know, all the powers were facing collapsing, uh, collapse uh, as a result of, of, of the years of war and the toll it was taking uh, uh, politically and economically and, 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 uh, and morally. Um, you know, maybe the world, the world may be moved very quickly these days, but I think it, it is a matter of time to see how effective that they, Will be uh, in it. Will they be affected in changing uh, the leadership in Russia? Or are they? Is it because the, the, the thought is that this will lead to the removal of Vladimir Putin, or you know that wealthy people in Russia will turn against Putin? Or that I, I don't think that latter one. The, the you know the elites turning is is all that plausible, but it really matters of how much does it hurt. Uh, a lot more people who will see that will the tide turn that that this whole venture 
and this leadership and this whole regime uh, is, um, is to blame. And that could happen over time. Uh, even although the government is doing everything it can to massage the message and blame the outside world for everything that people may be suffering. But a lot of Russians are quite skeptical about government in general to believe all, all of it because those of us who've lived there, you know, in their own kitchens and in their own lives, there's a certain skepticism that they have of everything and fatalism too, uh, which is very much part of, if you will, the souls of people in Russia and Belarus, including even in Ukraine. And as you and Chris Crowley and I, you know, use the levers of, you know, democracies in a broad sense, what role do you see the control of media in Russia having at this point in time, especially with this newer uh, law that was passed. I mean, is that, is that a pivotal piece of the control that Putin has over, over the country by controlling the media? Does that, is that as important as arguably the military to control the narrative? Well, it's a two-edged sword. In some respects, it's kind of an, an act of desperation. Uh, you know, it's part of a game plan that if you, you know, you're, if you're not doing so well, you want to bat down the hatches. You don't want people to get the bad news. I mean, this is something about many countries at war, uh, you know, is to have censorship and not, you're not going to show pictures of, of the dead and dying. You're going to have the positive spin on everything. Uh, in order to maintain the popular support. Uh, it's something I think, you know, all governments uh, and not just the Russians would employ uh, in, in war um, and, uh, and, and use every, uh, everything, all their powers that they have. Now, in this day and age, however, it's extremely difficult, I think, technologically, uh, you know, because there's, there, you know, there, there's so many sources of information but even though the cutting off of, you know, of even of internet and Facebook and that, which is some, these, these are also sanctions that are doing, which is you wonder, okay, is this, how is this affecting Russians being able to talk to other Russians if, you know, if, if, if they're being deprived by sanctions, if you will, of the ability to even to talk among themselves and does this actually help the regime in its own desire to basically restrict information and restrict and control what people say and, and think and do? But uh, I've always found that, you know, under these circumstances, the more severe it gets, the more creative people become in how to get around it. I mean, there's the whole matter, even in, in the Soviet Union, in, in all the days of how people communicated and said what they thought under the most severest of, of, um, of um, uh, repressions. I mean, I lived in Poland when there was martial law. It was my first assignment in the foreign service. And I was amazed at all the things, I mean, the Polish government did to repress people and the like. And yet there was always someone an effort how to get around it. And I think in Russia, too, you were finding people finding their ways of expression. It's like a, almost a game. It actually is exhilarating and, and gives people purpose to, that this is, this is important of how we are under a lot of pressure. How do you adapt and, and get, out, get out from under it? So it, it can have the opposite effect where also people just won't believe anything that comes from the government anymore because... Uh, they have really, uh, uh, you know, there are other, no other sources, but there are those that feel that, is this going to lead to what, there are some Russians that, that talk about the zombification of, the, of society, where they're trying to create zombies that cannot think and are, have no access to outside information. But, you know, it's very difficult. You can't, it's hard to put a whole society, even, you know, under, under such a blanket that even the Soviet Union was unable to do so. <clears throat> okay, so John Schlosser has asked, do you think Putin's thinly 
scaled nuclear threats refer to Russian military doctrine on the use of tactical nuclear weapons, or is he essentially threatening use of strategic nuclear weapons if NATO crosses into active mil military support of Ukraine? Well, I don't think he wants to use them, but I think having the threat of using them and what the reaction to making that threat, because you never know, would he or wouldn't he? And who's going to test that? Uh, and, and, and realizing that there will, you know, responsible people who also have nuclear weapons like the U.S. government or in Europe or everything, I've always had to think twice because there's always this, you know, the, 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 the car that the Russians have, and they have a massive nuclear weapons arsenal, um, as we do, but they also have a massive tactical nuclear weapon arsenal, which we don't have. And I don't take lightly, you know, the threat that is being made, although I think that it is being made at this point in order to, you know, frighten and, and perhaps rightly so, that, you know, you push us too far and expect this, and then what? And then what are you going to do? You want to escalate it more? over this issue or not. And so this is, you know, hardball in the extreme uh, that is being played. And uh, it's, you know, it is not to make decisions, responsible decisions for, for if you're thinking of the security of your whole nation, like the United States or France or Britain, is can you say that this is, this is at stake when you have nuclear weapons in the mix, uh, you can't you can't wish them away, or feel that somehow oh somebody's going to stop and say no, you know stop the hand of of, of Vladimir Putin or whatever to not do this. It it, it is you're, you're we're we're in a realm of what was previously of science fiction, if not the unthinkable. But you know, in the world, anything could happen. So I don't exclude it. With, with that segue, uh, what do you believe the nature of war would be if Putin were to move into any neighboring NATO country? Well, I, I don't think that, you know, that they would, they, they want to go into any NATO country. I mean, they, they basically left like the Baltic countries, you know, early on, it was like, well, you know, they didn't see, you know, an actual threat. The threat that they saw was, you know, that if the Americans are there or they're going to be putting uh, nuclear weapons there. Um, I, I had the, it, it, once I heard the Lithuanian ambassador say uh, to me that, well, uh, it's not that NATO is, is important. It's important as that battalion of Americans that are on our soil, because what that would mean is if the Russians did anything or killed Americans, uh, that would mean a war with America. Uh, and you know, by the same token, I think the Russians view that ups the ante. Uh, if you know you're going to be pouring things right on their border, and you know would would perhaps you know cause them to take an action to take out something or to show that look you can't get away with this for free. I mean, you just don't know. And that's why the idea of how to de-escalate this, because the spiral can can it go out of control on 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 both sides that can lead to unintended consequences that you then have to deal with that could even lead to more escalation um, as you know as these things play out. Uh, I mean, you know. This is the real world now. This isn't, um, you know, uh, a, a, a computer game. Wow. Um, and these are real people with ideas and thoughts and fears and security and insecurities that can lead to decisions being made and actions being taken, the ramifications of which they hadn't even thought of. Uh, Will Tutrello asks, 
how much independence do you think the Russian military has from the civilian security elements of Russia? Well, the Russian military has always been fully under the command of the civilian. Um, in fact, that's one of the legacies of the Soviet Union in all of these republics uh, that emerged. None of them have turned into military dictatorships. Um, unlike uh, the French and British, the, the you know, colonies that, that merged as independent states from the French and British uh, empires, if you will. Interesting uh, enough. Uh, the fact that Poland, when I was there, was martial law. The commander, the, the president of the country was a general. Um, Jaruzelski, uh, the, you know, but but the military has always been firmly put in its place. I mean, the defense minister himself is not a military man, um, and the generals have, you know, have always been put, you know, in their place. And uh, and the military, it's it's the military has has been given a lot of toys, a lot of uh, you know this high tech stuff, but not the rank and file of, you know, the, of, of the soldiers whose life, except for special forces and like most of the effort has gone into, you know, the domestic security forces, which is where they feel that's the true security problem they have is maintaining security in their country and how to then have a billet, an external military that can be used for, as they are saying, as they call this war, special operations, but not full-blown wars of, of in past. Um, so I don't think like a military coup, there was the matter that in 1991, you know, when the, you know, the, 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 the Soviet troops were sent to uh, take over the Russian parliament where Yeltsin was, and the people, and the fact of Russians firing on Russians may be another issue in and of itself. I don't think there was a problem so much of firing on other people like Georgians or Ukrainians or, or, or Lithuanians back in the day or whatever. But if it comes Russians to Russians, that's another issue. And those forces uh, and regiments that are now in Ukraine back in in Russia if they were sent in uh, to um, uh, you know to 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 kill other Russians that's another matter that I I don't I don't know or don't think that many in the Russian military would want to take on that responsibility Chris Crowley has asked what might be the Russian reaction if Finland and or Sweden join NATO Well, uh, they they with Sweden, they they've already felt that Sweden is 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 close enough, and that's why you find the Russian navy and submarines and all sorts of mysterious things popping up in the fjords of you know Sweden and the like. And Finland, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Finns are are extremely realistic, and I know there's a lot of saying, oh well, there's a, the, the Finns might join NATO, and there's a feeling, but I'm not confident that Finnish politicians and the Finnish people who have had to manage Russia and the Soviet Union and their independence was predicated on their ability to do so, uh, that they would want to expose themselves uh, to uh, the consequences of NATO membership for themselves. I mean, they can always have uh, you know, a relationship with NATO without being a member of NATO. But um, I mean, they are a country that have uh, learned and have a realistic appraisal of their capabilities in order to maintain their, as it were, their, their sovereignty and their field of maneuver. And I think the, the Swedes um, somewhat similarly uh, have that uh, that that understanding too. So, I I think the consequences of NATO membership, if they were to judge them, might be or the benefits as as, as opposed to cost, may be less beneficial 
in the minds of many, uh, to the extent that I can understand now what the minds of Finns and their leadership is, as well as um, Swedes. So uh, I know they would face a much more hostile, that is the Finns who have a long border with, with Russia and not one that is, you know, defended uh, and, uh, and the like that, that 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 um, they would they don't want to have I would think a hostile relationship with that neighbor. One of our former um, military intel board members asks, "Do you think Russia has taken the threat of cyber attacks off the table? There were threats initially as retaliation against sanctions." Well, I think they're, they 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 will they would employ it, and um, I I you know I I think that this may be something that they feel is another arrow in their quiver of how good they are. But then there is the matter of what can be done against them in in cyber warfare. We're we're getting into again a new form, at, which we're already seeing. I mean, in the United States, there there have been these attacks, and and also the use of media and 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 um and all what you might call the uh you know the influencers uh <clears throat> you know using you know using a system against itself you know they 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 study the united states very very carefully and see well, these are all the vulnerabilities this is how you can manipulate and and the americans do this themselves they give us the opportunities to do it because it's just this is their system this is the way they operate. You have, there's the competitiveness, ambitiousness, there's po pol political, uh, uh, you know, fighting of the vicious kind. And, you know, yeah, a little money here, a little here, fault news, outlets that they can mask all the way along. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a game, you know, for them of how you can play the Americans because they understand, they look at the American system, but then they try to insulate themselves because they play this game of how they can insulate themselves from this being done against them. Uh, <clears throat> how good they are at it that way, I just don't know. Um, it would be interesting to know if, you know, these, uh, we're hearing there's a big brain drain from, from, from Russia. Many Russians fleeing, going to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and Georgia and all these, anywhere they can go. And a lot of them are in the, in the tech industry and the like, or tech people too. Now they probably can always find people that they can pay enough to 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 do this work, but I didn't know exactly how how big their capabilities are and how big our capabilities are to counter it, um, and how insulated the Russian, the you know the Russian system is from how or how digitalized is it uh, compared to us, where you know we have taken this to you know such a, a level where. You don't even use cash or money very much. And so much is, is on internet that we rely on the security and safety. The Russians have been going down that line too, but I don't know if they have the capability of protecting themselves from a, a cyber a, attack against their whole uh, system uh, because maybe they haven't digitalized as much across the country as the US. I, I, I just, as a little anecdote, I remember when it was Y2K, remember the turn of the millennium, and we all thought the world was going to go up in smoke or something, and I remember we had to go into the, I was in Moscow at the time, go into the Russians all the time, the State Department was saying, ask them, how are they prepared, how are they prepared, what's going to happen, you know, when, when the clock strikes, uh, strikes 12 midnight, in the year 2000, and I remember the Russian, Russians are saying, look, don't worry about it, no, so much, so little of our country is digitalized. We still have old ladies that pull manual switches, you know, at our power stations. We haven't gone that far. And it's, you know, I guess it's a good thing. So I was out on Red Square. It was midnight, you know, the, the Kremlin uh, clock tower strikes. Everyone looked at the power station across the river and it was still smoking. The, you know, the, 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 the lights were on and everything. And everyone got a big cheer and broke champagne bottles and everything. I, you know, again, it, it 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 shows you there's a difference in a way of how digitalized. Well, that was then. That was you know, and and now of course they are more digitalized, but largely in places like Moscow and 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 Saint Petersburg. 
we, we're really close to wrapping up. There's still a couple of questions that are pretty interesting. So Tiborg asks, do you see any dangers for Zelensky from the nationalists if he compromises um, or a danger of resentment? I think from the West, if we get too much or not enough involved in this quasi domestic dispute. Well, uh, you know, President Zelensky, you know, who was who was propelled into office by a population that wanted the end of the confrontation with Russia. Interestingly enough, uh, but in his but the parliament and other parties, you know, in Ukrainian politics, makes it would made it firstly impossible for him to take those steps uh, that maybe others, many people thought he would take somehow to end this conflict. I think even the, the Russians themselves thought that, oh, Zelensky, here's somebody we can deal with because there's this attitude of that somehow he's being thwarted by the power of nationalists uh, opposed to him in the parliament, even though in parliamentary elections, he was, he, he, he was, he was still leading, although his popularity was ebbing quite seriously before all this happened too. So, I think Ukrainian politics, uh, yes, uh, it will be extremely difficult for, uh, you know, for him with certain, you know, for a number of of, of, of Ukrainians uh, to make make uh, concessions to the Russians. Similarly, it would be for any American president or politician to be doing so uh, as well as, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, others because of the sense of you've, you, that, that whatever, you, if there's any concession, that means the Russians have won something. And that's extremely difficult politically uh, for any Ukrainian politician or American politician, I would say. And, you know, in Russia, it's it may be less so because they don't have the, the parties and like as well. But uh, you know, to make to make concessions. Uh, so yes, I I think uh, he uh, he's he's always been in a very difficult position politically in Ukraine, and and this even that is Zelensky, and makes it. Um, this situation makes it even more difficult for him. Although if there is a sense of just end it, will he be, will there be a relief among, you know, the population that is suffering, the people of Mariupol, Nikolaev and the like, that this hell will end for them. And, you know, and that to consider Human life more than pride and nationalism. It's 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 a very hard choice for a politician to make. Um, this will be the last question. Do you think Russia might move on Moldova, linking up with the breakaway region of Transnistria, where pro-Russian forces have been based since the breakup of the Soviet Union? Well, my Moldova is is. Is, is in a uh, uh, like like as any of the border countries of Ukraine and Belarus and Moldova is one of them you know, as well that has a Russian army in Transnistria and and a Western leaning president who has opened the doors to um, to 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 so many Ukrainian uh, refugees. Um, but is caught between kind of Romania that still feels that Moldova should be part of Romania, and then you know Moldovan sense that we're independent, and yet, uh, but is is um, and, and they and they they have a a, a set, set of government, and a, that that is dependent to a certain extent, and has worked trying to work with the Russians and manage the Russians, and in fact the deal that was struck. Um, you know, a few years ago was basically one that the Russians brokered, even though their candidate ended up losing, uh, if you called, you know, the pro-Russian candidate. So I think they want to, the Moldovans will want to play this very, very carefully. 
uh, because they're, they're, I mean, the Russian army is, uh, is, is kind of a hostage there too, because you've got all of Ukraine between it and Russia. I, I, how it's supplied and where it's supplied, it's not the army that it used to be. Um, and so, but if Russia were to take over Ukraine or have a government that is so lean, leans, uh, you know, is leans towards Russia, which I think is, is, is you know, could happen, but whatever. Then, you know, Moldova may find is, is it itself going to be pulled in the direction, you know, as being a former part of the Soviet Union as part of, okay, but they're not, you know, a Slavic people, but the Slavic people that live in Moldova are on the Transnistria side. So could it mean that Transnistria would become the next son of Luhansk and Donetsk and be incorporated uh, in, you know, if what Russia seeks is the territory of what is South Ukraine that would sweep all the way over to the strategic Dniester River and that that would then fall into this, um, this, this territory that would be controlled uh, by the Russian Federation. I, I believe that's probably a, was a thought of the Russian government, uh, you know, that perhaps they could achieve this and then bring back into Russia all those territories they felt were truly Russian that were sort of attached to Ukraine in the Soviet period in order to create the Ukrainian uh, Soviet Socialist Republic, um, which was, you know, a favored republic by the leadership in the Soviet Union, of not, not Joseph Stalin, but certainly by Khrushchev and Brezhnev, who came out of the Ukrainian Communist Party hierarchy, if you will. Okay, well, uh, to those whose questions I didn't, uh, didn't have enough time to ask, you know, my apologies. Um, I'd like to keep an open door invitation to you, Ambassador Kroll, maybe six months or so to come back and have another discussion. It'll be very interesting to see where, where all of this is in, in six months. Um, on behalf of all of SIDWAC, we really appreciate your time and your insights. Um, on behalf of SIDWAC, and of course, personally, I also wanna thank you for your long career serving you know, our country and particularly in this very difficult and complicated part of the world. And also a shout out to Chris Crowley. Thank you so much for, you know, representing some of our AID presence here. And um, we look forward to having you have a discussion maybe about the democracy efforts uh, in the region as well. So thanks to everybody. Uh, we went over, so I'm not going to talk too much about our next events, but we do have an event next week. So please go online and take a look. It'll be International Water Day. And we'll be talking about water issues on the West Coast all the way down to Mexico. So again, thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you, East Coasters, um, Ambassador Kroll and Chris Crowley. And good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Christine.